this morning. Hallelujah. Come on. Will you remain standing? Will you give Jesus the greatest shot of praise you can? Come on. Father, we bless you. We exalt you. We magnify you. And we place you on the high place, King Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, remain standing. Everybody smile big. Let me see all your teeth. Make this faith declaration out loud. Come on, say it loud. Say, I believe that God wants me to win. Come on, shout it like you mean it. Come on, say, I believe that God wants me to win. How many believe that today? Come on, do you believe that? I heard somebody say years ago, Jesus is not returning for a dull, bored, weak, anemic, scared, scratched up, indifferent bunch of losers. But he's coming back for a victorious church, a triumphant church, a winning church. And I, and I hope you believe this today. Whether you're watching online, Salisbury, I love you guys. And Pastor Billy, we love you guys. Wherever you're watching right now or here in the room with us, let me tell you, God wants you to win. He's not mad at you. He doesn't hate you. He loves you, and he wants you to win. Come on, do you believe it? I hope you do today. Amen. It is an honor to be here, and I love you, Pastor Melanie, Pastor Jay, who is my very, very dear friend. And, uh, yes, we've been uh, friends a long, long time, and uh, we talk all the time because there have been times I wanted to give up, and it had, if it had not been for Pastor Jay, I might have quit. Come on. And there's been times, I promise you, he wanted to quit, but I was there just to speak life to him. And uh, we truly are, are, are closer than brothers. And I love this house. I love this church. And there's a lot of new people that I see today. Uh, and uh, my name's Johnny, but I don't know everybody here. So on the count of three, would everybody tell me your name as loud as you can? Come on, here we go. One, two, three. Okay, now I know everybody. All right, listen. What I'm about to share with you, if you can see what I'm about to share with you, I, I love what Pastor Eric said, not because he said that about me, but I truly am in Ephesians 4.11 called out evangelist. And I, I'm, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a prophet. I am not a teacher. I am an evangelist. And I'm asking that that anointing of an evangelist will rub on you today. Because listen, I said this to Pastor Melanie uh, while I was worshiping earlier. I said, there's enough people at the refuge and in all the campuses. There's enough people to change the atmosphere of this whole community. Uh, that, that was pretty pukey, all right? I said, there's enough people in the refuge and on all the campuses to change the atmosphere of this region. Come on. Do we believe that? And that's what your pastor believes. And, and, and I want to stand with my friend today. I want to stand with the vision of this house. And I want to agree with you that what I'm about to share with you, if you'll let God rub this anointing, especially this week, come on, what I'm about to share with you can be life-changing. And so I want us to pray for two things. First of all, let's pray for God's anointing. Everyone say God's anointing. And, and, and I need you to help me. I preach so much better when you preach with me, all right? So I don't want you just to sit there and absorb it. I want you to preach with me. If I say something that sounds good, you say, amen, hallelujah, that was good. If I say something you don't like, you say, amen, hallelujah, that was good, all right? As, as Spurgeon said, we're here to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. Hallelujah. So I need you to help me preach, all right? Second thing I want us to pray for is an open heart. Everybody say, an open heart. Listen, by 3 o'clock this afternoon, we're going to see something happen. Oh, there you go. All right, you're with me. All right, no, we'll get you out on time, all right? Come on, lay your hand on your heart with me. Come on, would you do it? Would you ask for his anointing? Come on, that, that anointing of an evangelist is going to rub on this house with pastor's vision. Father, thank you, Lord, for Pastor Jay and Melanie. Thank you for the refuge, God, all the campuses, God. Thank you for what you're doing in Salisbury, God. Thank you for what you're doing in this house. And, Lord, we just believe for miracles, miracles, miracles that you would come, almighty God, and by your spirit you would do what no man could do you would speak to our hearts. So Lord, lift me above my abilities today and Lord, help me to say what you want to say. And if I say the wrong thing, let your people hear the right thing and let us leave built up and edified and strengthened and better than we were when we came in. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see what we can do to influence this region for this hour. And we're careful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for you and you alone, King Jesus, are worthy. And we bless you now in your mighty name we pray. Everybody say, Amen. Hey, before you're seated, would you fist bump somebody next to you and you can be seated? Hallelujah. 
If you got your Bible, go ahead and open it with me to the book of Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37, and we'll look at verse 1 there. I'll be reading from the New International Version if it's uh, different from what you have, but we'll look at Ezekiel chapter 37. While you're turning in, in, your, uh, in your device or in your scripture, uh, listen, I believe this, what I'm about to say with all of my heart. I believe we're living in the greatest time maybe in the history of the church. And people, it gets real quiet when I say that, but people are like, hey, wait a minute, time out. Don't you know we're in a pandemic? Don't you know there's an election this week? Don't you know that there are riots and the potential of riots? Let me tell you what, I understand that, but I also know this, light shines best in dark places. Come on. And, 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 and I mean, believe with me that God is not scared. Come on. I believe the Lord sent me here with a dump truck load of encouragement for you today that you are in a, a supernatural position, Refuge, here at Salisbury and all the campuses. You're in a supernatural position to influence people like never before. Uh, and, and, and let me tell you why I, I think we're in the greatest time maybe in the history of the church. Since the pandemic started back in March, I have led six of my neighbors to Jesus. Can, can, can somebody give the Lord a shout of praise for that? Let, let me just explain that to you and, and why this is so exciting to me. Uh, two years ago, there was a young lady and her, her husband, they moved to uh, Mobile, Alabama, where I live. I live from the great state of Alabama. Uh, don't hold that against me, all right? Uh, you know you're from Alabama when you brush your tooth, right? Uh, you know the toothbrush was invented in Alabama. If it had been invented anywhere else, it would have been a teeth brush, all right? So... Uh, 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 right there in Mobile, there was a young lady, uh, my wife and I were out walking in our neighborhood and we greeted this young couple that was walking toward us and we heard her accent. We said, where are you from? She said, I'm from Scotland, England. We're, we're like, how in the world did you get from Scotland to Mobile, Alabama of all places? She said, well, I'm a professor at the University of South Alabama. We said, oh, welcome to Mobile. We're so glad you're here. And then she said, well, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a minister of the gospel. And she stuck her hand out in my face and said, I want to stop you right there and tell you I'm an atheist. I don't do the God thing. And how many of you know we need discernment? Come on. Now, I am an evangelist. My natural inclination would be to go right after her with the word of God and prayer and believe for her. But the Lord said, don't say anything. And I said, you know what? That's okay, man. Welcome to Mobile. We can believe whatever we want to believe or not believe what we don't want to believe. We're just glad you're a part of Mobile. Well, I, that was back in, in the pandemic when it first started. And uh, uh, just a, uh, right after that, the Lord had me start something for our uh, community. Uh, as an evangelist, uh, uh, all of our services canceled in one week for the rest of this year. Uh, and as an evangelist, you know, we depend on every week going out to do ministry in the local churches. So in one week, all of our services canceled for the rest of 2020. And so I was like, okay, Lord, what do we do here? And I wasn't scared. Uh, I wasn't nervous, but I was a little anxious. So I was like, Lord, what do we do? And so he said, go to your garage. And so I went to my garage, and, he, and that's not my typical prayer place. But he said, call on my name in your garage. So when I got in there, he said, what do you see? And I said, well, I see a lawnmower, and I see a weed eater, and I see an edger and a rake. And he said, good, go to work. And so I started a lawn business, Johnny's Lawn Care. I'm sorry for the lack of creativity in that name, all right, but uh, that's what we called it, Johnny's Lawn Care Business. And, and the Lord gave me 22 lawns to take care of in one week. Is that awesome? I put out flyers all over the community. One of them was the neighbor of this professor at the University of South Alabama. And so I was out there uh, a couple of months later, and, I, 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 and she's uh, twin little girls, beautiful little girls, uh, during the, uh, right before this pandemic started. And while I was cutting her neighbor's grass, uh, she came out, and I said, hey, Jenna, how are you? And she said, oh, I'm scared to death. And I said, why are you scared? And she said, because of this pandemic and my children. And I said, can I tell you why I'm not scared? And she said, please. And I told her my story of how I became a believer in Jesus 40 years ago, that I was a borderline alcoholic. My life was a mess. I was spiraling out of control. And a beautiful young lady invited me to go to church. And she was so pretty. I said, honey, I'll go anywhere with you. Come on. And I didn't go to church. So I went to church with her. And I'm sitting on the back row of Moffett Road Baptist Church in Mobile, Alabama. And I heard about a God who loved me and a God who could help me. 
And I said, if that's true that God loves me and God can help me, then I want that. And I walked to the front of that church and I gave my life to Jesus on July 22nd, 1979. And I said, Jana, I haven't had a drink of alcohol in my mouth since that night. And I said, right after that, I led my dad to Christ. I led my mother to Christ. I led my brother to Christ. He's a Baptist preacher. Y'all pray for him. Then I led two of my sisters to Christ and God moved in my heart. And I'm not afraid of the future. And I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. Come on. And I, and I, I she started crying right there in the street. And, and, and she said, I, and here's what she said. She said, I've never believed in God, but I need to believe in something. And she said, uh, and I said, can I just read something to you? And I always tell believers to keep the Roman road scriptures on their phone. And I have the Roman road scriptures right here on my cell phone. And I read Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I said, you, me, all of us, everyone has fallen short of God's glory. I said, can I read you another scripture? And I read Romans 6.23 that the wages of that sin is death. Boy, we all deserve death. And someone had to die for the payment of our sin. But here's the good news. Everybody say good news. Come on. Come on, shout it. Good news. The good news is that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That Jesus paid the price for my, my sin so that I could live forever, Jana. Then I said, can I read you one more? And I read Romans 5, 8. That God demonstrated his great love for us. And that while we were still in our sin, Christ Jesus died for us. Aren't you glad that in all your mistakes, Jesus died for us? Come on. In all of my mistakes, he still loved me that much. Then I said, can I read you one more? And she had nowhere to go. So I, I read a Romans 10, 9, and 10. That if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart God raised him from the dead I can be saved with my heart I believe and I am justified with my mouth I confess and I am saved and how many of you know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and when I began to declare the word of God to her right there in the street in front of her house she started crying even harder. She said how do you talk to God? I said just like you're talking to me and she said is it that easy? And I said, because Jesus paid the price. Yes, it is that easy. I said, but it's going to cost you everything. I said, Jana, salvation is free, but it wasn't cheap. And it's going to cost you your future, no longer what, wanting what you want, but what God wants. And she said, I want that. And I want you to know, standing six feet apart, come on somebody, standing six feet apart in the street right there in Mobile, 20, just a few months earlier told us she was an atheist, come on. And now today she's born again, she's attending an Assembly of God church in Mobile, Alabama, and God's changing her family. Come on somebody, shout to the Lord for that, come on. Can I tell you, it never would have happened without this pandemic. I may have never had a chance to talk to her, and for that I am grateful. And I've led five other of my neighbors to Christ uh, just cutting their grass for them. That's why I tell you, we're living in the greatest time. Is God at work? Come on. I said, is God at work? No matter what you see in the news, no matter what we face this week in an election, I'm here to tell you, God is at work. Hallelujah. I want to show you a picture they're going to put on the screen for me real quick. And uh, I got this picture 40 years ago on the night that I got saved. My pastor gave me this picture. I love this picture. And, um, and, and he told me, he said, son, if you're going to live for Jesus, you're going to have to live by faith. There's going to be times life is going to try to swallow you. Can anybody feel that way today that it feels like every devil that is not busy has come to visit you? Come on, anybody? And it feels like life is trying to swallow us. And it looks bad for that frog, doesn't it? It looks really bad because his head's in the mouth of that crane and that crane's about to take him down. But I love what he does. He takes his little hands and he grabs that frog, uh, that, that crane by the throat and says, you ain't going to swallow me today. Come on. And you're not going to swallow me. Come on, say it. You're not going to swallow me. Come on, shout that. You're not going to swallow me. Come on, like you mean it. Come on. You're not going to swallow me. And unfortunately, this is where a lot of Christians are living right now. This is where the American churches, I, I, I feel like right now, that we've got our, it feels like we've got our head in the devil's mouth and we're going down for the count. I'm just telling you, here's what I hope you'll walk out with today when you leave in just a little while, that you're going to say this, I got the devil right where I want him. <laughs> that I'm going to reach out. You may, you may think you're going to swallow me. You may think you're going to take me down, but I want you to know I'm going to grab you by the throat, devil, and you're not going to swallow me. I'm not going to let the circumstances of this season swallow me. I'm going to choke the enemy, and I'm going to live in the victories of God even when it looks bad. Come on. And I want to show you something in the Scripture today that the Bible is filled with people that life was trying to swallow them, but they got a baptism of faith. 
They got a baptism of faith, and they believed that God could turn it around for them. And one of them is in the story of Ezekiel chapter 37. I'm not going to let it swallow me. Come on, say it. I'm not going to let it swallow me. Ezekiel 37 verse 1, the Bible says this. The hand of the Lord was on me. Stop right there. Can you imagine anything greater in life than the hand of God on you? I loved when my, my boys were little, and I would, uh, I would lay my hand on them, and I would rub their hair. And then I thought, oh, my goodness, it could come out. So I stopped doing that, all right? But, but I loved when they were little and just putting my hand on them. And, and I know that always brought comfort to them to know that their daddy was right there with them no matter what it was. See, when the hand of the Lord is on us, it's a sign of God's favor. It's a sign of God's approval. It's a sign of God's uh, anointing in our life. And when we think of the hand of the Lord on us, we think of miracles. We think of signs and wonders. We think of the glories of God. But I want you to know in the story, it's not that way. It, it wasn't about the glories of God. It wasn't about miracles. It wasn't about uh, 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 the, the, the good things of God. It was, it was a hard place. And life was trying to swallow the prophet of God, Ezekiel, and God came to him to show him something prophetically for the house of Israel. And then I believe to teach us something for this hour that we're in right now. Ezekiel 37 verse 1. Keep reading with me. It says, the hand of the Lord was on me. Keep reading. And he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord. And he set me in the middle of a valley. And it was full of bones. And he led me back and forth among them. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. Bones that were very dry. And he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Look at me if you would. When this passage was written, I want you to understand that Ezekiel was not some novice. He was not some new minister. He was a seasoned prophet in the house of God. And he had seen miracles after miracles after miracles. But when God comes and stands in front of him and takes him out and shows him in this vision and shows him this valley of dry bones as far and as wide as he can see is nothing but dry bones to say that maybe they'd been there for a long time. And God asked him a, a fundamental question. He said, Ezekiel, I want to ask you a question. Can these bones live where life used to be? Is it possible that these bones can live again? Can I tell you that while we're sitting in this room, whether you're watching at Salisbury or somewhere else online right now, America is looking at the valley of dry bones right now. And God is asking us the same question. Is it possible that these bones can live again? Is it possible that America can have revival again? Is it possible that we could see things change toward the things of God? And the answer is emphatically 100%. Come on. Yes. We're not waiting on God. I believe God's waiting on us. And here is Ezekiel, the seasoned prophet who's seen all these miracles. God asks him, can these bones live? But he's a little bewildered. He's a little overtaken. He's a little confused. Because the answer that he gives was so faithless. He said, well, Lord, you alone know. And I want you to understand that God, did God know the answer? Come on. Did God know the answer? God knew the answer. What he was looking for was someone to get an agreement with him and speak over these dead bones and say, dead bones, you don't have to stay dead anymore. Dead marriage, you don't have to stay dead anymore. Dead teenagers, you don't have to stay dead anymore. Dead America, you don't have to stay dead anymore. Come on. And I believe that God was asking him to get an agreement with him. But there was a little confusion, maybe a little bewildered, a little overwhelmed. Because as far and as wide as he could see, it was just dry, dead, dusty bones that had been there for a long time. And I love what God does next to the prophet Ezekiel, the seasoned man of God. God comes to him and tells him exactly what he wants him to say over this dead place. Anybody here ever put something together before and you, and, and you didn't read the instructions? Can you hold your hand up? Anybody here? Okay. How many of you like me? You missed a step and you had to take it apart, okay? If you miss one of the steps here, you're going to miss one of the things God was doing here. In verse 4, read along with me. God shows him this valley. There's bones everywhere. He says, can they live? And Ezekiel says, well, Lord, only, only you know. You're the only one that knows. Read verse 4. Look what God says to him. Then he said to me, prophesy. The word prophesy means open the mouth and declare out loud the things of God. Did you get that? The word prophesy means open the mouth and declare it loud. She's looking at me like, man, he talks fast. All right, listen, okay. We, we open the mouth, declare out loud the things of God. Look at what it says in verse 4. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the what? He didn't say, Ezekiel, I want your opinion. Is America full of opinions right now? 
He, it wasn't the opinion of Ezekiel that he was looking for. He was looking for the word of the Lord that was coming out of his mouth. So look at what he says. He says, you, he says, say to them, prophesy of the bones, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 5, this is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you to make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Look at me. Ezekiel could have rebelled. He didn't have to do this. He's looking with fear, obviously, or confusion. I, I don't know, God. I just don't know if it's possible they can do this. So God says, all right, here's exactly what I want you to do. You speak over these dry bones exactly what I'm telling you, the word of the Lord. Because how many of you know the word of the Lord will not return unto us? What? It's going to, there's power in these words. And I want you to know that he says, you declare this old covenant that he was reading from at that time. You declare what I've done in the past. You declare what I'm capable of doing. You declare the word of the Lord over this. And I want you to know this, that as he, he, he was standing there, he didn't have to do it. He could have rebelled. But I love what he does out of sheer obedience and raw determination with no guarantee that anything was going to happen. Look at what it says in verse 7. Will you read it out loud with me? It's on the screen. Will you read verse 7 out loud? Come on, say it. It says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. Come on, say that loud. So I prophesied as I was commanded. Come on, shout it loud. Come on. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, opening my mouth, declaring the things of God, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked in tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them but there was no breath in them look at me can you even imagine standing there one moment you're looking at a valley as far and as wide as you can see there's nothing but dry dead dusty bones and then as you begin to speak the word of the lord over the skin and over the tendons and over the breath all of a sudden there's a, a convulsing and a, and a cracking of all of those bones there in that valley. And all of a sudden now they're covered with tendons and, and now they're covered with skin but the bible says there was no breath in them if he would have stopped right here, all he would have had was a valley full of corpses because there was no breath in them. He was at the halfway place of a miracle. Can I tell you, there's nothing to me more miserable than the halfway place to a miracle because you're halfway between your miracle and halfway between a curse. You're halfway between a promise and halfway between an unfulfilled expectation. You're halfway between life and halfway between death. And if we stop at the halfway place, we, we can see both ends, but we can't touch either one of them. And here he is, he's standing here, and, and, and now there's a bunch of corpses in front of him. If he would have stopped right here, he would have had a bunch of corpses. How many of you know he didn't stop? Come on. Come on, read verse 9 with me. Look at what it says in verse 9. It says in verse 9, Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. Verse 10, will you say it out loud? Come on. So I prophesied as he commanded me. Come on, say it. So I prophesied as he commanded me. Come on, shout it. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And look what happens. And, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet a vast army. Look at me. Was the vast army in the house of God or out in the valley of death? They were out in the valley of death waiting for someone to come and prophesy, open the mouth and speak out loud the things of God that you don't have to stay dead anymore. I want you to understand we're standing in the same place here in 2020 with an election week this week. Why is Johnny Jernigan standing in front of you wherever you're watching this right now to stand with Pastor Jay and Melanie Stewart and say God wants to baptize you with faith. God wants to baptize you with hope. Come on somebody and God wants us to believe that if God is the same yesterday, today and forever, if he did it for Ezekiel, then we can speak over America and say, America, live again. Come on, say it. America, live again. Come on, shout it. America, live again. Shout it. America, live again. And maybe there's enough of us in this room that pushes the demons back and the darkness back and that this week we're going to see something that we've never seen before, not just an election, but people returning to the house of God, people running to the house of God, people running to the name of Jesus, and what was dead will live again. Marriages will live again. Teenagers will live again. Finances will live again in their homes. Their businesses will live again. Can God do this? I don't think God's, we're waiting on God. I think God's waiting on us. We need to be driving everywhere through uh, Kannapolis. We need to be driving everywhere through Salisbury. We need to be driving everywhere through Charlotte and speaking and saying, God, let life come in that house. God, let life come in that house. God, let life come in that business. God, let life come in that school. God, let life come in that church. God, and because the power of life and death is where? 
The same tongue that can say I love you is the same tongue that can say I hate you. The same tongue that can say I bless you is the same tongue that says I curse you. How many of you know, his, he said I've given you the power of life and death, but we choose life to start speaking over the dead places. And what looks impossible, God says, I can turn it around. And what looks dead to you, Ezekiel, I can bring life in the dead place. I believe God's waiting for the church. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for me. Salisbury's waiting for you. He's waiting for all of us to say, dead bones, hear the word of the Lord. Just declaring this word brings life. Hallelujah. It pushes demons away, and the victory of the Lord can be ours. Yes? We have not because we ask not. And when we pray, we pray amiss. He said, you pray very, very specifically. John chapter 17 is the high priestly prayer of Jesus. In 26 verses, Jesus uh, gave out over 27 specific declarations. Don't just pray sporadically. You speak to Charlotte. You speak to Kannapolis. You speak to Concord. You speak to these regions. Uh, uh, it's even one called China Grove, isn't it? Come on. That we speak to, there's a song about China Grove, but we, we speak to every area and say, devil, can, can you put the picture back on the screen for me? Put this picture back up. I want you to know, this is where we are, church. Do you see this? This is where we are. And we can let the enemy swallow us, or we can choose to say, I got the devil right where I want him. Come on, say it. I got the devil right, come, will you choke him with me? Come on. I got the devil right where I want him. And God wants us to speak over these dead places, Yes. Go to 2 Kings chapter 4 with me. I'm not going to put this one on the screen for you, but I want you just to read along with me in 2 Kings chapter 4. Another situation that it looked impossible. It was trying to swallow them. There's no way they're going to see the miracle of God in the middle of this for sure. And let me give you the background of this story uh, in the previous chapters. You can read it earlier. It's the story of the Shunammite woman. I love this story. And how many of you know this story? Wave at me if you know this story. It's a woman who, with the prophet of God, Elisha, stayed with her. She took care of him. She put a bed in the back room of her house, and uh, she had a table and a lamp, and she fed the man of God when he was there with her. And when he got ready to leave her to go to another region, he said, how can I bless you? And his servant, Gehazi, his armor bearer who was with him, he said, she doesn't have a son. And, and in Israel, it was to be a little bit of an outcast, not to have a firstborn son because they wanted to pass the family name and that anointing to that firstborn son. And so she was a little bit probably uh, feeling the anxiety of not having a child. So Elisha prophesied over her and said, within a year you'll have a son. Did God give her a son? Come on. Yes, the Lord did. Read the, you go read the story. God gave her a son. So he lived for a period of time. We don't know exactly how long, but the Bible tells us in the previous chapters he was out in the field with his daddy. And he says, my head, my head. And we don't know if he had a brain aneurysm or if he had a brain tumor. We don't know what happened. But he fell dead there in the field. And his daddy scooped him up and ran home with him to the mom, to his wife. And this is where the story picks up in verse 28. Will you read along with me? It says this. She said, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? She said, didn't I tell you don't raise my hopes? Look at me. She's screaming back probably in this crisis moment that's trying to swallow her. Her child is dead. How many mothers are in the room? Hold your hand up. Can you even imagine what she was feeling in this moment? Some of you, unfortunately, may have had to feel that what she, she felt in that moment. How many daddies are in here? Hold your hand up. And in this crisis moment, she's screaming at the prophet and saying, why would you give me a promise only for it to die? Why would you do that? Didn't I tell you don't tease me? And this promise is now dead in front of her. And I love what Elisha does. He doesn't just panic. He gets involved. He says, we're not going to let this swallow us. We're going to believe in faith what God can do. And I want you to keep reading, if you would, now in verse 29. He says, Elisha said to Gehazi, I took your cloak into your belt. Take my staff in your hand and run. Don't greet anyone you meet. And if anyone greets you, do not answer them. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So she, he got up and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face. But there was no sound of response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, the boy has not awakened. Look at me. The prophet of God says, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to believe that we're going to choke the enemy. And death is not the final result when the power of God is available. Death is not the final result when the power of God is available. What if it's your marriage? If it's your, there's somebody here, your marriage, you're about to give up on it. Don't you give up on it. There's somebody here right now, your business, you feel like it'll never change. I want you to know death is not the final word when the power of God is available. 
He said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to speak over this dead situation. He said, hands his staff to his servant Gehazi. He, he was a little bit older than him at this time. So he says, you run on ahead of me. I'll be right behind you. Go ahead and lay my staff, which represented his anointing and part of his mantle. And so he goes up and he lays the staff on the boy's face. But the prophet gets there with the mother and, and she comes with him. And, and, and he says, hey, we laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound of response. The, the boy has not awakened. Did Elisha look at the woman and say, look, I'm, I'm so sorry. We, we prayed that God would give you a son. You had him for a little while. I, I, I hope it's been good, but it's time to plan the funeral. You need to bury your little boy. Is that what he said? Did he look at her and say, look, you took care of me, and I appreciate you taking care of me. You fed me, but look, lady, your son's dead. Just bury your boy. Did he get angry with her? No, keep reading in verse 32. I love what happens here. Verse 32. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the, this is a shocking statement. Then he got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. That's not pandemic uh, qualified. As he stretched himself out on him, the boy's body grew warm. Look at me. The prophet of God gets there. They've laid the staff on the little boy. So he gets there, and he, he doesn't panic. He calls on the name of the Lord. He cries out to the Lord. And God, uh, they, they had very long garments that they wore at that time, and they had headpieces, which represented part of their call. And they had very long beards. So I, could, I got a vivid imagination. He was probably walking back and forth in the room, and he's rubbing his beard and touching his headpiece and rubbing his beard, touching his headpiece. And obviously the Spirit of the Lord said, lay on top of him. So he, he, he crawls up on top of him, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. How many know that's pretty close? And he's laying on top of this dead boy. And the mother's over in the corner watching this. Can you imagine what she's thinking? What is this crazy prophet doing? How many of you know when God sends a miracle, he rarely asks us how he should do it? Come on. We just need to trust in the Lord that he is at work. So he's laying on top of him, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. And the Bible says his body grew warm. In other words, life is starting to come back into this dead little boy. But if he would have stopped right here, all he would have had was a halfway place to a miracle. 98.6 on a cold, dead frame will make it get warm, yes? But that life is beginning to come back in. And I love what the prophet of God did. Read verse 35 with me. Come on. It says this. In verse 35, it says, And Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room. And then he got on the bed and stretched out on him once more. And then the Bible makes this little throwaway statement. It says, The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Look at me if you would. I know it's not on the screen, but look right here. The Bible says that after he, he's laid the staff on him, he's crawled on top of him, he walks back and forth in the room. And he says, well, Lord, I've laid the staff on him. I've laid on top of him. What do we do? And God says, lay on top of him again. So he, he crawls up on top of him again, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. And then the Bible says, and the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. That is not pandemic qualified right there. Come on. I was at Walmart the other night, and I was shopping, and I sneezed, and the whole aisle cleared out. Man, I'm telling you, I, I, it's great shopping in a pandemic. All you got to do is sneeze, and you can get anything you want. People are like, get away from me if you're sneezing. He's laying mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands on top of this dead little boy. And all of a sudden, this little boy starts convulsing. <laughs> and then a second time. <laughs> and then a third time. <laughs> and then a fourth time. <laughs> Come on, do it with me. And a fifth time, come on. Then a sixth time, come on. Then a seventh time, come on. That was really funny right there. All right. And I want you to know that the Bible says he opened his eyes, he got up, and his mother went and got him and brought, came down and knelt down to the feet of the man of God and, and, and gave praise to her God. I want you to know there's no indication anywhere in this passage that the man of God ever got off of him. If somebody sneezes in our face right now, specifically right now in a pandemic, we're like, get away from me. What are you doing? Get away from me. There's no indication he ever got off of him. He laid there and the little boy got healed and the man of God is covered in spit and snot and it's all over him because he never got out of, off of him. And I want you to understand this. The only thing dead people know how to do is sneeze. The only thing they know how to do is vomit or throw up on us. And I want you to know what God has, has spoken to me about this passage. Refuge, hear this. Salisbury, hear this. This is for you. 
What he's saying is the dead culture, those who don't know Jesus, don't know any better but to sneeze and cough and throw up on you. That's all they know how to do. And don't you get up off of them. I don't care how many times they riot. I don't care how ugly they are, how many bad things they say about the president or what's happening. You just lay on top of them, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. And no matter how many times they sneeze on you, you keep speaking words of life that this dead boy can get up and live again. This dead person can get up and live again. And I'm not going to get up off of them. They can curse me. They can say anything they want to, but I'm not going to stop because I want you to know what's going to happen this week is not just because of Republicans or Democrats. It's because of the house of God that the people of God are speaking over America and say, dead bones, live again. Shout it with me. Dead bones, live again. Come on, shout it. Dead bones, live again. Can God do it again? See, we're waiting on God. I think God's waiting on us. And your pastor, who has such a dream for this community, this is not just a nice little church here at the refuge. This is a revival center that God has placed you in to be a loud voice to the dead places all around this region. The dead people, you don't have to be dead anymore. Dead teenagers, you don't have to be dead anymore. Dead businesses, you don't have to be dead anymore. Dead churches, you don't have to be dead anymore. That we're going to keep speaking life. We're going to keep speaking life. And we're going to keep speaking life until something comes to life again. Yes? If God did it then, can he do it now? Come on, bow your heads with me. Lay your hand on your heart. Worship team, can you come? Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around for just a minute. I believe the Lord put you here today on this election week for you to believe that you can be baptized in faith. That if God could take an ordinary man called Ezekiel and use him as his prophet, if God could take an ordinary man like Elisha and use him as his prophet, and life could return into dead circumstances. It can happen again. Every head bowed. Look look at me for just a moment. I I wasn't going to say this, but I felt the prompting of the Lord. Was everything trying to swallow Job? Anybody know the story of Job? It's an amazing story that God and Satan have a conversation. And God said, there's nobody like Job. He's a man who fears God and shuns evil. And what did Satan say? You put a hedge around him. Take that hedge, he'll curse you. So what did God say? You can attack him, but you can't kill him. And did the enemy attack Job? Come on, help me. Did he? First thing he lost was his livestock, all of his cattle. Why is that mentioned first in the Bible? Because when you don't have livestock, you can't make sacrifices. And if you can't make sacrifices, you can't spill blood on the altar. If you can't spill blood on the altar, you can't get God's attention. If you can't get God's attention, you can't get his protection. And if you can't get his protection, your enemy can do anything he wants to you. Job knew he was in trouble when he lost his livestock. Then he lost his children. He lost his houses. He lost everything that he had. He had boils on his body. Three friends that were making him suicidal. A wife that told him to curse God and die. It'll never get better. But Job never stopped returning to God. He never stopped returning to God. Job 22, 23 says, If you return to the Lord God Almighty, you will be restored, you and your household. He never stopped climbing back in Daddy's lap. And then the Bible tells us in Job chapter 42 and verse 10 that the Lord gave him how much? Twice as much as he had before. I wish I had time to read the scripture. He had got twice as much as he had before. And there were nowhere in all the land found children as beautiful as his children. His three daughters, his seven sons. But the first thing it says he got back was his livestock. And Job knew that God was choking his enemies when he saw those livestock coming in because he knew he could make sacrifices. And if he could make sacrifices, he could spill blood on the altar. And if he could spill blood on the altar, he could get God's attention. And if he could get God's attention, he could get God's protection. And if he could get God's protection, no matter what the enemy does, he's going to live in the victories of God. The enemy did everything he could to swallow Job. He never stopped returning. Come on, lay your hand on your heart. Will you bow your heads with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed, whether you're watching there in Salisbury, you're watching online, wherever you might be, every head bowed. If nobody's told you they love you today, let me tell you that Jesus loves you beyond anything that you understand. He's not mad at you. He doesn't hate you. He loves you. But he loves you too much to leave you where you are. And I believe he wants to rub the anointing of an evangelist on you in this season right now that we are going to speak over the dead places and say, live again in Jesus' name. The miracle is in your mouth. I said, the miracle is in your mouth. 
But I'm an evangelist. I have to ask a question, and I need Christians to pray right now. Somebody's life is in the balance in this room. I don't know who you are, but I want you to know this. I want to ask you a question. If you die today, do you know that you know that you know that you'd be in heaven with Jesus? What's a really important question. Every human being is ever going to have to come to reconcile this question. See, you can fool me today because I'm pretty easy to fool. You can fool your friends. You can fool your pastors. You can fool your parents. You can fool your neighbors. But you're never going to fool God. And he knows you. And he loves you. And he's, he's speaking to somebody in this room right now. And he's saying, don't let life swallow you. Run to God. That's where your answer is. Run to the Father. That's where your answer is. They're screaming in hell right now, begging us to listen. It's too late for those in hell. It's not too late for you and me in this room. I don't care how many drugs you've taken, how many drinks you've had, how many mistakes you've made. God loves you. And he says, come to me and I will give you life. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, pray Christians. If you're a Christian, I need you to pray. Young lady, young man, mom or dad, guest here. Or if you're watching at home or in Salisbury, ask yourself, God, are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? You're the only person I'm talking to right now. You're the only person I'm talking to. And if you're here and you say, you know what? I'm not sure if I died, I would go to heaven. And you can play games with your future, but I promise you, the Bible promises a lot. It just doesn't promise tomorrow. This may be the last chance you ever get to hear this question. So I beg of you before it's too late. If you're here under the sound of my voice, you say, I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. But I want to make sure that this is that, that I'm not playing with my future. I want to make sure that heaven's my home. No matter who's on your right and left, no matter who's in front of you and behind you, this is not between you and anybody else. It's between you and Jesus. So if that's you, young lady, young man, mom or dad, guest here, if you're watching online or in Salisbury, you say, that's me. I'm not sure if I died today, I'd go to heaven. But I want to make sure. I don't want this situation. I don't want life to swallow me. I want to choke the enemies, and I want to see the victories of life in my, my life. If that's you, no matter who's around you, you say, Pastor, I know it's me. I can fool everybody else, but I can't fool God, and I need to get closer to Him today. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to play games. I want to make sure that things are right with God and me. If that's you, no matter, no matter who's on your right, left, who's in front of you, and behind you, no matter where you're watching, if you say, Pastor, that's me, I need to get closer to Jesus today. I know the end is coming, and I want to be ready. Pray for me in that final prayer. If that's you, when I count to three, raise your hand right now. Shove it down the devil's throat. Don't anything stop you. I need to get closer to Jesus. Include me in that prayer, Pastor Johnny. Here we go. One, two, three. Raise it now. Raise it now. Yes, 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 yes. In the balcony. Come on. Those that are there, those watching online, those watching on Salisbury, come on, raise your hand right now. I need to get closer to Jesus. Come on. The Bible says there's a the angels rejoice in heaven. There's a party in heaven for every person that just raised their hands right now. Come on. I want to ask more time. Come on, Christians. I just feel like somebody's life is in the balance right now. I didn't feel it in the first service. There's something urgent in this room right now. Somebody's life is in the balance. If you didn't raise your hand a moment ago, but you know you should have, I should have raised my hand. I can fool everybody else, but I can't fool God. I need to get closer to Jesus today. Include me in that final prayer. If you didn't raise it a moment ago, but you know you should have, come close to Christ right now. I'm not asking you to join this church. Although this is an amazing church, I'm asking you to join the kingdom of God. So if you didn't raise your hand a moment ago, when I count to three, raise it right now. Shove it down the devil's throat. Here we go. One, two, three. That's me, Pastor. Yes. Yes. Anybody else raise it? I see you, honey. I see you, young man. I see you, young lady. I see you, young lady. I see you, young man. I see you, young lady. Anybody else? I see you, honey. I see you, young man. Hallelujah. Father, I've done everything you told me to do. Now, Lord, give the increase. Help me decrease. And, Lord, help them to see you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Would everybody stand with me for just a moment? Come on, stand with me. Nobody leaving for just a moment. I, I sense a real anointing the Holy Spirit wants to give you in just these next few moments. Those of you that raise your hands, I know who you are. You know who you are. God knows who you are, and the devil knows who you are. The first step is always to raise our hand. The second step is to publicly stand for Jesus. He was crucified publicly, buried publicly, and resurrected publicly. I want you to know it's going to take us saying, you gave it all for me. I'm going to stand for you. And people pray in every religion. Prayer alone doesn't just get us to heaven, but it's a beginning point of growing into the man and woman of God that chokes every enemy in your future to live in the life of Jesus. Yes? 
So I want everybody in this room, look at somebody next to you and say, if you need to get close to Jesus today, I'll go up there with you. Would you just turn and ask somebody that question? Whether you know him or not, just turn and ask someone. If you need to go get close to Jesus today, I'll go up there with you. Because that, that question can change somebody's future. And I want you to know nobody's going to laugh at you in, you in this room. We're going to give you a standing ovation. 40 years ago, I was an alcoholic. And they were all, la- all giving me a standing ovation when I went to the altar that night. And they were saying, there goes Johnny, there goes Johnny. Because they knew my alcoholic ways. Nobody's going to laugh at you. We're going to give you a standing ovation. So if you raise your hand, if you're watching online, if you're watching in Salisbury, if you raise your hand in this room, you say, I need to get it right with God. I need to get closer to Jesus. This is a celebration moment right now of choking. I said, this is a celebration moment of choking the enemy and watching what God can do. So every person that raise their hand, if you raise your hand, when I count to three, you come stand right here with me. Every person that raise their hand, take the second bold step and come right here. Here we go. One, two, three. Come on right now. Don't wait. Every person that raise their hand, come on. Right here. Come on. All the way across the building. Come on. I'm waiting for you. Come on. Come on. I'm waiting for you, girls. Come on. I'm waiting for you, ma'am. I'm waiting for you. Come on. I'm waiting for you. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Will you clap for them? Can I give a clap for them? Come on. Just the keyboard for just a minute. Just the keyboard. Look at me. Come on. Can somebody shout for these young ladies? Come on. And you know what? Look at me, girls. Look at me. I could have left you in your seat because it's hard to walk in front of people you don't know. But we celebrate you. Is that right, church? Come on. Do we celebrate that today is a changing day? That you may be the next prophet to the nations. You may be the next voice to America that says live and not die. It may be you're the next Ezekiel. Maybe it's that other one that raised their hand back there, that man back there, that young man back there. And I know it's hard to walk in front of people you don't know. But I want us to pray a prayer. Would everybody bow your heads with me? Would somebody come stand with these beautiful young ladies? And look at me, church. Can I give you a word of encouragement? And this is going to sound like a rebuke, but let me give you a little encouragement. Everybody look right here at me. You know why a lot more lost people didn't get saved here today? Because there's no lost people sitting in here. If you'll get them here, it's not Pastor Jay's job to lead them. It's your job. And if every week we'll get the lost in this building, this altar will be filled with people coming to Christ. We've built a new platform. we put down new carpet. Let's get ready for souls to come to Christ. Now is the time. They're waiting for us to lay on top of them. They're waiting for us to speak life over the dead bones. We can't just come to the building by ourselves. I prophesy over you refuge in Salisbury and right here watching online that you will never come to the house of God again without inviting someone to come with you. Oh, that was pretty pukey. Come on, let me say it again. I prophesy over you refuge, and I prophesy over Salisbury that you'll never come to the house of God again without inviting someone to sit with you so that when Pastor Jay gives the altar call, this altar is filled with people giving to Christ. Is that good? Is that good? Come on. Do you still love me? Stretch your hands toward this girls. Stretch your hands toward these that prayed that prayer. Everyone pray this out loud so nobody be embarrassed. Everybody pray it out loud. Come on. Salisbury, pray it. Those watching online, you pray it. Come on, here we go. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I know it was my sins that nailed you on that cross. And I'm sorry, Lord. Please forgive me. I say with my mouth, that Jesus is the Christ. And I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. I give you my past, all of my mistakes, all of my hurt, all of my pain, all of my sin. I give you my future, everything I will ever become. And I start over today, a child of God. I will choke every enemy. I will not let the enemy Swallow me. Baptize me with faith today that you died for me and I will live for you for all of my days, choking every enemy and seeing the life of God in every situation. In Jesus' name. Now come on, put your hands together for these that prayed that prayer. Come on, believe right now that those that prayed that prayer, that the anointing of the Holy Spirit is going to do something in them. 
just another minute. I know you're ready to run. I'm ready to run with you. Come on. If you're here today and you just prayed that prayer, they're going to speak to you in just a moment what you need to do. I want to speak this to the body right here. How many of you today have something that's trying to swallow you? Come on. I, I'm, I'm raising my hand first. I've got something. Come on. It may be your finances. maybe a doctor's diagnosis. It may be a job situation. If you're here today and you got something trying to swallow you, the Lord sent you here. My brother right there with the blue shirt on, look at me. The Lord sent you here today to say, you're going to live and not die. You're going to live and not die. And you're going to see the victories of the Lord. Hold your hand up. If something's trying to swallow you, hold your hand up. Look around you. If somebody has their hand raised, will you move to them real quick? Gently lay your hand on their shoulder. Come on, look. They may be behind you. Go to them real quick right now. And let's pray a prayer of faith and believe right now that we're going to choke every enemy, especially this week in the election week. Come on, stretch your hands toward these that are standing. Salisbury, we're praying for you, those online. Father, today in Jesus' name, we pray over every one of these that are standing, that have their hands raised, that the enemy enemy's not going to swallow them. The enemy's not going to swallow them. They're going to see the victory of the Lord. They're going to choke the enemy and say, I'm going to live and not die. I'm going to live and not die. Marriages live. Families live. Businesses live. Sick bodies be healed. We sang it. Giants are still falling. Sick bodies are still being healed. We believe it today, oh God, over every need in this room. In Jesus' name. Now can we all lift our hands to our Father? Come on, all over this room. Can you lift your, if you're comfortable with that? And come on, say it. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to let it swallow me. Come on, say it. I'm not going to let it swallow me. Lord, let faith come on your people. Let faith come on your people. Let them believe today that you still move mountains. I've seen you move. Will you do it again? Come on, you move the mountains. Hallelujah. Can we sing that to the Lord? Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. altar. I felt that the Lord said to prophesy over you right now. If you want to win souls, you want this to be your season to choke every enemy and to lead people to Christ. Run. Don't walk. Come on. Get here quick, quick, quick because we're over our time and Pastor Jay's going to get on to me. I'm in trouble already. Come on right now. Get down. If you want to be a soul winner, you want to be an evangelist. I'm just telling you, I know the dream that's in your pastor. I know the dream that's in this house and God doesn't want this just to be an ordinary house. He wants this to be a life center that miracles and signs and wonders. And you know what signs and wonders are? It's when God sends signs that makes people wonder. I told Pastor Melanie, it's super, the word supernatural means God rubs his super on our natural. And that we see God do something. Come on, if you want to be a soul winner, lift your hands. Come on. If you want to be a soul winner, lift your hands. Father, I'm asking as the anointing of an evangelist that I heard Pastor Eric say, God, I don't say this because of my arrogance. Lord, I realize I'm nothing from nowhere. But Lord, you are everything. But I know the mantle that I wear. As an evangelist, I'm asking. Come on, lift both hands as high as you can. Come on, believe right now. As I pray this over you, believe that the Lord is going to use you this week. He's going to use you specifically this week to speak life 
life over dead people. To speak life over dead souls. Come on. Oh, I sense his anointing. Come on right now. Father, let the anointing of an evangelist be released over the refuge and the vision you've given to Pastor Jay. And that, Lord, that every week from this week forward, there's going to be an anointing to draw people to this house. That we're going to put them in our cars. We're going to pick them up in, in buses. We're going to get vans. We're going to call them. We're going to text them. We're going to email them. We're going to talk to them on Facebook and on Instagram. God, whatever we have to do, that we're going to get them to the house of God in this hour. And so, Lord, rub the anointing of an evangelist on these that are standing in this room right now. In Jesus' name, let that anointing. Come on, now lift your hands and say, I receive it, Lord. I receive the anointing of an evangelist as I pray this, Lord, over this congregation, as we pray it over the ministry network of the refuge. God overwhelmed the book over uh, Brazil, over Greensboro, over Salisbury, God over Africa, over all that you're doing through uh, Middle Eastern television. God, what you're doing through the ministries of the refuge. God, from the children to the senior adults, let there be a soul winner's anointing coming over this house. Lift your hands and prophesy that. A soul winner's anointing is coming to my church. Come on, open your mouth and say it. A soul winner's anointing is coming to my church. A soul winner's anointing is coming to my church. A soul winner's anointing is coming to my church. We're going to be soul winners. We're going to be soul winners. We're going to go and gather them and we're going to choke the enemy off of them in Jesus' name. We're going to choke the enemy off of them and we're going to see them come to God in Jesus' name. Now come on, can you lift your hands and can you shout that again, brother worship team? Come on and let that just ring out of you. God, we've seen you move. We've seen you move but we're desperate for it again, God. Can we let a celebration begin to break out this place and believe for miracles this week. This week we're going to win souls. This week we're going to win souls. This week we're going to win souls. Yes. Come on, lift your voice and shout this to the Lord. I see. 